Next up, please join me in welcoming Representative Muhammad Noor. Uh, Mr. Noor represents District 60B and is serving his first term in the Minnesota House of Representatives. <laughs> he is the Vice Chair of the Jobs and Economic Development Finance Division. Representative Noor, welcome. Thanks. So great to have you with us this morning. Joining Representative on stage is the Hill Senior Editor at Large, Steve Clemens. Steve, take hey it away. Hey everybody, good morning. Happy Monday. Uh, we should start a club uh, and show up here every Monday morning. I'm sure you'll all love that. Uh, thank you for welcoming the Hill uh, to your, your neighborhood. Uh, this is one of the first programs that we've done outside the Washington area. I'm sure uh, you click on our, our uh, uh, news items and whatnot that we do, but it's, I'm very pleased that we're out here today in person. Uh, and I'm glad to meet you. Uh, oh, thank and I you. just have to say, you know, I really enjoyed reading about you the last, I was just telling you in the green room and kind of laughing. You've been running for office and running, you ran around against Ilhan Omar, you ran against all these people and, you, and you've won now. Uh, and, and so I just want to start out, where, where, where do you hope to, to where, where's your next uh, post you're running for? Well, I'm, I'm in the right place at the right timing, so I'm, I'm in a good place. We need to be in the house, so we need to be addressing some of the issues that we'll be talking about today. I think I'm comfortable where I, I am today, and I'll continue to do that work. But what impressed me in looking at the profile, um, both of what you've, you've, been, um, you've been looking at renters' rights, you've been looking at uh, 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 various communities that are underserved and have been left out of some of the access points in this, um, I've been reading about you in the opioid crisis and various things that you have thought were, were priorities. But what is, just, just before we get into the hard issues about the affordability crisis in, in housing, what's driving you uh, to play the role as a representative that you're doing? Quite frankly, um, Representative Dowd just talked about the crisis that we have. We've got disparities in any given level, from education to housing to healthcare to employment and jobs and so many other things, we haven't been able to close those gaps, those opportunity gaps and the achievement gaps continue to persist. We are not finding the right solutions because we are avoiding them. People are trying to look for other people and say that that's their problem. It's not. We haven't opened the doors for individuals to succeed and be able to feel that they belong. So that's something which actually drives me every single day to continue the fight that I'm fighting. So we're here largely talking about housing, affordable housing, the mix of what's coming online. Kurt Dowd gave uh, some, some data that I, I was unaware of. I did not know that the uh, housing situation was as tight. I mean, 51st in the nation uh, is something to take note of. If you had, if, if you had more power and resources to push three, three parts of that picture, what would you do to solve it? Because I think sometimes that's clarifying. We do have an emergency when it comes to housing in Minnesota. You know, the income rates are very low compared to what's happening in the rent and also affordability to buy a home. So we need to close that income gap that already exists. Fighting for $15 minimum wage is even lower than that because a rent for a one bedroom, if you look at the market rate, people will say it's 950. It's not. It's more than 950 when you come to Minneapolis. I could not afford to pay rent. So is the answer more stock or is the answer putting price caps and that takes you well, to a different, that takes a good, you towards an, an, an economic management that some good, might call socialism, but I won't necessarily. But I mean, the, I think the broad question is how do you, do you, do you bring more stock on to get prices down or do you put price caps on? Well, let's, let's step back a little bit. I think we need to increase the uh, minimum wage to something that is more affordable. Uh, for you to afford a one bedroom, you need to earn $19 an hour. We don't have those jobs. When you look at people of, uh, you know, people of color indigenous, they need to be earning at that level to afford one bedroom. So right. that income gap already needs to be addressed. The second piece, I think if things are not under control, we have to introduce rent control, which is really unfortunate that we will be stepping into that field. Mm. But when you look at the process that we have right now, we've got an emergency. People are paying more than 50% of their income into housing. They're not investing in their kids. They're not building the future. They don't have good education. They don't have good housing. Where are we going to go to? Because if you keep on pushing people out of the city, they'll keep on going outwards, and you end up having problems with those who are left out, and. Quite frankly, it's a crisis that we've own, uh, created ourselves. Do you sense, um, I, I, and I know this, we did a program the other day in Washington on veterans, and in this area I checked that there are a great number of veterans who serve this country in the same uh, affordability crisis, paying more than half of their income today uh, on, on, on rent. And so I guess my question is, I, I heard Kurt Dowd up here, but 
you know, I, I also read that you were very disappointed in the last session uh, that you had, that you thought these issues were not taken seriously. So for such a crisis, uh, what, what do you need to happen on, on, on both sides of the aisle to get some constructive action? So during the session, we were trying to get at least $150 million invested in housing, uh, but we ended up getting $60 million. That was the only... $60 couple, million? Yes, unfortunately. Uh, and quite frankly, uh, we need to have a significant investment when it comes to the next session where, where we're talking about capital investment. Right. I think going to $500 million will be the right starting point, an investment so that we can have good public housing. We can start addressing home ownership significantly because right now 350,000 home in Minneapolis is not something that I myself can afford to pay for. What about those who are in the lower income? What about those who are aspiring to own a home? What, what happened to the American dream when people are dreaming about housing and yet we're hearing about public housing being grabbed by people who are wealthy and well-connected? Mm -hmm. So we need to disrupt that system and say, no, we can no longer let the system fail us, but we need to invest so that we can provide opportunities for everyone. You know, I was impressed with the questions that were just posed to the, to the minority leader mm -hmm. about um, the you know, where things are done, landfill areas coming in. And, and a couple of years ago, I spent some time trying to understand the life of a home builder and the life of people moving in and, and how you would do it from just the very detail of doing it. And, and uh, the minority leader up here made a comment. I don't think he meant that word, but he says there's a lot of duplicity in the system. I think what he meant is sort of duplicated replications, but we can call it duplicity. It was an interesting use of the word. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but. I guess the question is, if you look at it from the, from the regulatory perspective of those that are out there, and I've kind of looked at, you know, say, compare this, this zone to Oklahoma. Oklahoma, mm -hmm. it's a lot easier to build a house in, in, or build homes in, you know, I would call sort of mixed-use uh, spaces uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma versus Minneapolis. Is there any self-awareness within the city that perhaps they need to look at regulatory code and the costs that are attached or the process? Because he raised it, and I'm just wondering if it's a legitimate issue. Well, uh, if regulation is in the way of you know, getting uh, more home ownership, we should get rid of it because the fight is we need to start opening the doors for those who we have left them out. Mm -hmm. uh, whether you're low income, whether you're senior, we've got more veterans who are homeless. So if you look at the homeless and people, we hear about people who are sleeping in the, in the transit system. We know we do have a problem, but we have reached state. We could have actually provided everyone who's homeless a home, but we haven't invested the dollars that are required to start addressing those issues. So if there's a, uh, the process or barriers that exist, it should not hinder the opportunity that everybody needs to have a home. Mohammed, the other um, issue, I talked to the head of real estate nationally for PricewaterhouseCoopers, told him I was coming out here, and I said, what would be cool and interesting people hadn't thought about? And, and this man, Byron Carlock, said, what is happening today is that prices are so high, they've been driven high, and, and that the financial sector bears a lot more responsibility than either home builders or cities, that we've used to look at home ownership as the backbone to building a new middle class, but essentially we haven't We've given people lots of ways to take money out uh, for whatever issue, but we've not given people the ability to kind of co-mingle their finances, to create intergenerational uh, ownership between generations. I know you deal a lot with students, uh, and you're very representative of those students that, that, that have been out there. Are there things that we should be looking at in the other part of the ecosystem that we're failing? Is it a blind spot? Well, uh, there are many blind spots when it comes to helping address the generation gap that exists when it comes to wealth building. Uh, I'll give you an example. In 2008, when we had the financial crisis, we put a lot of regulations in there. So many people who are able to afford to buy, now the barriers are in front of them. Uh, the banks are not willing to lend unless they have good secure information that this person will afford to pay. So. The, the African-American or black in, in the state, uh, more than 30% own homes. Right. right now, it's up to 20%. That's shame on us because we haven't addressed that issue. We haven't looked into what other things are we creating by putting a lot of regulations that hold people back. So at least looking from that perspective, we need to start opening more doors. Maybe we need more co-ops. Maybe we need people to you know, find other avenues find venture capitalists who are going to invest in a process whereby it makes affordability something more affordable. So right now, well, the rates have gone up, the prices have gone up. We're tapping people out of access to wealth building at all. So mm -hmm. this is something I think we need to start having conversations about. I want to go to the audience for a minute to give them an opportunity to share their, their thoughts and views. But, you know, I'm a 
writer, storyteller, and mm. sto in most stories, we like to have heroes and villains. <laughs> um, who are the villains in this story from your perspective? I think the wealthy and well-connected folks uh, have taken advantage of people who are unable to really afford their lives. Uh, students cannot afford to pay their rents. Uh, the uh, people of color indigenous have not been given the opportunity. And politicians like myself and others haven't done the right work to increase more home ownership, more uh, affordable housing, significantly investing in something that people can feel they live in a good home mm. and be able to afford their lives. That's something I think we can all collectively come together and do that. I, I'm going to stick one more question and then, I, and then did you have your hand up? No. Okay. Uh, We'll, we'll get some other questions out here, but I want to ask, but there's a difference between a house and home, and just when you said that, I could sort of feel that you share this view, that, that a home is uh, where you feel safe, a home is where you feel connected, mm. there's a home is part of a community, and I've been worried, and many of us have been in this sort of new digital age, worried about whether community is surviving, and I'm interested in your views of this area in general, but as you think about your role in trying to promote, are there things that we're not doing to kind of remind people of the significance of community? That means empathy, that means working with each other, that means helping each other. Absolutely. I, I think we have, uh, we worked away from the moral perspective in terms of what is our moral obligation to help those who need the most. Uh, in Minneapolis, we had the company. That's a face of what we have right now. Uh, and so we have to look at the continent from homelessness to home ownership. Where are the gaps? How can we get somebody who never had an opportunity to own a home, who was homeless, to now say that I can own a home, they have got a good job, they can raise their family, they can afford their lives, they can pay for health care, they can pay for food, they can survive in a good environment. We can also start addressing safety issues, we can start addressing the education gaps that exist. But you have to start from somewhere. Without a roof over your head, without having a good job, then we are leaving people behind. And significantly, when you look at that, it goes mostly to the people of color indigenous who are mostly impacted. So we need to take our resources where, the imp where we can have a significant impact. We need to start looking at equity. Many people don't understand what equity means. It's helping those who need the most, but not taking away from those who need uh, at the same time. So we have to structurally, uh, fundamentally shift to something that is more transformational when it comes to housing and home ownership. Thank you so much for that. Let me open up the floor to, to folks here. Yes, right here in the... Uh... Katie, did I mess it up? Everyone, this is Katie Garner who's running this around. Uh, thank you, Sorry. Representative Noor. I, I really appreciate what you're saying this morning. Uh, you brought up uh, the topic of public housing. Can you talk about how uh, public housing is underpinning the crisis and can you speak to the need to invest further in uh, public housing? Uh, thank, thank you for, you. for the question. Uh, the issue of public housing is well known. Uh, right now we don't have enough stock of public housing. Uh, federal government walked away from investing in public housing and the state has not invested in public housing. So that gap has already created a big issue of waiting list. Many people who uh, want to live in a public housing will have to wait for many, many years. They'll have Do you know to... what the financial gap is, just so we have a fix on that? Well, it's significant. I think that we, we will have to have uh, billions of dollars in order to address that issue. Uh, so I don't have the numbers, quite frankly, with me right now. But then at the same time, you have got people who want to go to the uh, rental assistant demonstration, meaning that they're, they're willing to go now to the private sector and say, look, we cannot afford to uh, have uh, public housing because we cannot maintain them. Mm -hmm. So we'll bring investors who will take the, the building and be able to keep it more affordable. So the question is, if the public housing can no longer pay, will that building go to a private sector who should not have had that opportunity? So we have to look at how can we address that issue and provide uh, assurance to the individuals that they're not going to be kicked out. Because what that will do is, instead of you living in a public housing, you now have Section 8 voucher to live in your building. And that creates a mess because people are not guaranteed and to have the same security that you have in living in a public housing. So we've got a problem. We need to address it right. collectively. Yes, right here. Yes, ma'am. That is my question then. Do you support privatizing or selling off public housing to private investors? And is there, do you trust that they will actually stay public housing, that there is a protection for people in 
public housing if it is so let me restate this for the video you're asking uh, does does uh, Mohammed Noor support selling off public housing and does he trust the mission which is to provide public ha housing to remain in place is that a fair Okay, great. So the private sector has already failed us in terms of creating that affordable housing. Uh, and personally, I'm going to be opposed in a way that privatization is the right solution. Public housing should remain public housing. It should help those who are veterans, those who are seniors who cannot even afford their lives. They should also provide an opportunity for those who are low income to be able to have a place to call home, uh, a place where they can, uh, at the end of the day, they can go relax and enjoy with their family. So, Quite frankly, I'm, I'm opposed to public housing going to privatization. Just real quick before we close, are you supportive of Minneapolis 2040? Absolutely. We need to create more housing. What but do you we think also is the best part of it? Because I'm, I'm still learning about it. Tell me what the biggest zinger is in it. Uh, the, the key issue right now is we need to start opening more spaces to have people to, ha to build a home. Right now, we've got families like me. If I wanted to create more opportunity in my own district, which is the highest uh, home uh, renters, we've got more than 90% home renters, if you look at the numbers, because I've got students, immigrants, and people who have been moving out and renting to folks, a small home where I can build more individuals so my extended family can live with me will provide me an opportunity. People with large families, we're looking at the future, but we also need to be more cognizant. We're not going to be extend so that people cannot afford it. So we have to have that affordability in the mixture. Well, I look forward to interviewing you at your next political job and your next political I, I, job. I next appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, Mohammed Noor, thank you. representative, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it.